When was the last time you completed a full review of your finances? The financial ecosystem, your financial ecosystem, what does it look like to put in a comprehensive DIY investor plan? Today, we're going to be speaking with Cody Garrett, CFP and founder of Measure Twice Money to talk about how he goes about this and how he does this with his clients and why it's for people specifically in the financial independence community, it's been so well received. In this case, the concepts we're going to be talking about are what come up during a a coaching session or a, a financial planning session with people from the financial independence community. These are the topics that need to be discussed, and I think they apply to all of us. So the question is, do you know what you don't know? Obviously, that answer self-fulfills. And now that you do, what are you going to do about it? Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, very excited to dive into this week's episode with Cody Garrett. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, this should be great. It's certainly financial planning for the FI community, right? For the DIY investor. And I think a lot of us are reflexively, I don't know, cautious, let's say, when it comes to financial advisors, financial planning. And I think for good reason to some degree, right? We've talked about the importance of fees and how that can compound negatively against you. But we've also talked at length about the value of a financial plan. And I think that's what's so cool about Cody is that he is coming at this as a member of the FI community. And I've gotten to know Cody over the past year. Amazing resource. Great guy. So Cody, with that, welcome to Choose a FI. I appreciate you both inviting me to be here. I'm really excited and passionate about the FI community. I always call it Choose FI instead of Choose FI, right? Uh, The FI community, I've really been a member of really understanding what Choose FI and defining financial independence for my own family since about probably 2017 or 2018, actually before I was even a financial planner. So, you know, it seems like kind of the, the natural trajectory in terms of aligning with the community as an advisor now is I can kind of, there's a lot of misconceptions certainly about Actually, there's a lot of truth, first of all, (laughs) about what a lot of advisors are doing, but there's a lot of misconceptions about really the value of truly comprehensive financial planning. So I'm excited to go into some of those pros and cons and what to expect, whether you are to build your own financial plan without an advisor, or if you're going to be searching for one in the future. I had the opportunity to listen to an interview that you really just recently did with Michael Kitsis on Nerd's Eye View, and I will have the episode number and, and the links if people want to check that out. But the reason I bring that up is it's always so refreshing to get to talk to a certified financial planner from the financial independence community. And it's such a rarity. And and I'd love to get your take on this, but I know for a fact there are so many people in the financial independence community that maybe do want to work with an advisor and have specific questions or things that feel like they're outside their scope of knowledge. They've been just a little fearful to tackle. And they come in with a list of questions to a prospective planner. And they ask them, you know, I really have heard about this really cool thing called the Roth conversion ladder and trying to figure out if this is a tactic that I could execute on. And the response is, well, what's that? (laughs) And, you know, interview over, right? Like we're not speaking the same language. We don't have the same goals. Like I want you to teach me. I don't want you to have to go learn this and report back. And so it's almost like you'd have to put so much work into helping them reorient because your goals are not the rest of the world's goals that you're like, you know what, I'll just keep trying to work on this myself or not look into it further. I'd love your take on that truly being a CFP from the financial independence community. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I, I've heard that a lot from prospective clients and even with planning as they say, I've interviewed a lot of financial advisors. First of all, they won't provide any planning without an expectation to manage my money. But secondary to that, they say, hey, I'm really interested in these early withdrawal strategies like the rule of 55 or 72T, like, you know, substantially equal periodic payments or Roth conversion ladders. And the advisor's like, oh, like, I'm not familiar with that. 
And then they're kind of like, oh, wait, so who's going to be the educator here? You know, certainly I would say, of course, financial planners, we all have to stay in our lane and knowing what we, you know, kind of serving the types of people we serve. One of the issues with financial planners is sometimes their firm doesn't truly align. Maybe either the compensation model or even the value they provide doesn't truly align with who they want to serve. So going back to, you know, when you're working with a financial planner who doesn't truly understand you, it's a lot of the, the technical concepts like early distribution strategies certainly are taught within the CFP curriculum. But the philosophy of financial independence is certainly not understood kind of like as a gross across advisors. And a big thing there is certainly, as we understand, there's a big misconception. They go, oh, you're one of those fire movement people. And what, what they mean by that is they focus way more on the RE than the FI. So what they assume is that you're coming to an advisor because you know you hate your job, you know you have a huge savings rate because you just you want to quit your job. They focus really on what you're retiring from rather than being focused on what you're retiring to. And again, they have kind of an innocent ignorance about really what financial independence means. So certainly, I think a lot of financial planners moving forward, and that's part of my hope for the planning community is that I can help educate that this is very different from what you read from articles. Like as you know, there's a lot of so financial media is really interesting. So first of all, in the financial education space, the media is very one size fits all dogmatic, always do this, never do this. You know, there's the top 10 things you need to do, right? So even within the financial independence community, we do have some of these kind of rules of thumbs we follow, certainly like the 4% rule, you know, VTSX and chill, like some of these kind of sayings that catch on the three to six month emergency fund. Are you suggesting that people in the financial independence community are dogmatic? <laughs> is that, is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> Are well, you saying that yeah. there's there's something that we have a bias towards? <laughs> well, thankfully, at least you know the bias is actually like aligned with what really matters in financial independence, which is aligning your money with your values, right? At least that part's not dogmatic. And certainly, I know Brad and Jonathan, especially in the podcast, you reiterate over and over again that your path to financial independence does not and actually should not look like the person next to you. So certainly within the FI community, we're, we're learning these things along the way that, you know, uh, I'm actually trademarking the phrase, keep finance personal, because personal finance, you know, there's a lot of phrases around that, but people always focus on the financial part, not the personal part. And I, I think the FI community is very much the philosophy is, I think, you know, catching fire and the alignment of money with values. And as a financial planner, I try to connect that with understanding a family's like truly comprehensive financial ecosystem. So the advisor community, many times they're really focused on the investments, right? Because that's the money that they'll most certainly want to manage moving forward in the traditional models. Hey, Cody, actually, let's stop there because I, I wanted to ask a question about that a couple of minutes ago when you brought that up, just to catch everybody up to speed. You said it's an expectation that a lot of planners have that they're going to manage the money. And I guess this leads into a discussion about the fee structure, the AUM. Could you give like a two minute overview to the listener who may not have ever heard of this before, why this is so critical to advisors and is such a potential negative for a lot of people in the FI community? Sure. So I think a lot of us can relate to this and kind of maybe how our, our family, maybe our parents or grandparents, you know, work with an advisor at some point. Really, it's funny, the financial advice industry really came out of a place of selling insurance products. Even some of the institutions that build up and educate financial planners actually came from a place of selling insurance. So insurance was always sold really as a commission product. You know, you may have heard people saying like, oh, well, like I don't pay my financial advisor, right? <laughs> and that, that really means that like their compensation is coming from something other than advice. And traditionally it's been from insurance policies. I mean, that's slowly shifted. And certainly you've seen this like whole chase to zero fees, right? With all the custodians like Vanguard and Fidelity, even having like, zero funds is that now there's a race to zero fees. So there's been a shift in terms of, I think in a previous episode, you talked about really how mutual funds, like you used to actually have to use a broker. You used to have to use an investment advisor to even purchase mutual funds. So as that shift has changed from the broker or the, um, you know, the agent being sold through the product that they sell you, or you know, they always say that uh, insurance is typically more sold than purchased, <laughs> you know, more, more sold than bought. But as that shift and people become, you know, our communities, you know, I use the word woke, we've become more aware of how really we're just paying, but it's not being transparent. And certainly our community and younger, especially millennials and younger are, we're seeking transparency and simplicity. And we want like really just honesty to be at the forefront of everything we purchase. So what's happened is the industry has moved from commission products to now what they call fee only, 
But what's interesting about fee only is it's not actually synonymous with flat fee. So most consumers, when they hear fee only, they go, oh, well, that just means I pay the advisor and then they provide advice or investment management for me. But the truth is AUM, so assets under management, is a compensation model, which is like kind of under the uh, umbrella of fee only. Assets under management is a way that, you know, let, let's say, for example, an advisor helps you with investment management. You know, they might put you into a model portfolio with some mutual funds, right? Those mutual funds might even be low cost passive index funds like we even use as DIY investors. But what they do on average is that you pay them 1% of your account balance, you know, paid quarterly, right? So, so divided by four. So every quarter of the year, you pay 0.25% of your account balance. So over time, we understand in the FI community, certainly we understand compound interest, right? There's two things that we really understand is one is compound interest. So we discussed a lot is what does that 1% do over time? Let's actually set aside the value of what, you know, working with advisor does at one, one point, which is saying, you know, what, what does 1% do over time in terms of compounding kind of the, in the wrong direction that we, in terms of fees. And also a lot of us in the FI community, we follow, you know, the 4% rule of thumb for distributions, right? So a lot of us are saying like, well, if that 4% turns into 5%, like, that, you know, there's no 5% rule, right? Or on the flip side, you're saying, well, if I'm using the 4% rule, the advisor gets 1% and I get three. So, you know, whether it's accumulation and the compound interest of that 1% AUM over time, or how that's going to affect your distribution strategy, our community is just very aware of the long-term effects of that fee. So what's moved even more now, so there's fee only, AUM sits underneath that. Now there's a shift right now toward advice only, which is really the comprehensive financial education for families without an expectation, obligation, or even the option to manage your investments. You had the, uh, the trademark phrase or in the process of being trademark phrase, bringing the personal back <laughs> to finance. And I wanted to point out to people that like Cody, like in 20, I think you found choose if I in, in 2018. And at that point in time, you were not a CFP. Is that, is that accurate? Right. I was actually a professional musician. I was playing gigs, doing Broadway shows, arranging music for record companies, like a very different lifestyle. Actually, I say that four years ago, I didn't know what an IRA was. So talk about trajectory and, you know, in terms of how quickly I think people can shift <laughs> in terms of their career. Right. So I just wanted to point out like the knowledge curve, like you've zoomed up the knowledge curve. You were already living a FI lifestyle without maybe knowing all the terminology at, at the point. In fact, I know even now with your CFP business, your savings rate is very, very impressive. And we can talk a little bit about your, you know, kind of what you've built for yourself there. But what I really wanted to go to is the knowledge that you gained by being in the financial independence community, not just being here in terms of immersing yourself in the groups, but actually implementing that knowledge for yourself and then scaling on top of that. And then to the point where you're teaching others is unbelievably valuable. This information is unbelievably valuable. And we're at the point in time where you can Google any question. We can all Google what a Roth conversion ladder is, and maybe we'll get an answer but it's that next phase of taking a concept and applying it to a personal situation and sifting through all the noise to say, how does this apply to me? That's you know very, very challenging for people. And so being able to find premium financial advice that's applied to your specific situation, this is the gap. And so you know, it's not that we're coming in here and we're saying there's no point in getting financial advice. You can just do everything yourself. Well, no, no. a lot of us are going to need significant help to implement some of these more advanced strategies, but it's knowing where do you need the help and then who to go to when you recognize that that is where you're at, I think is like, you know, the real point of distinction here. And I'd love for you just now having set that up for you to talk about people that are working with you, where do you believe you're able to offer the most value? Where do you believe that for people in the financial independence community, when they're having these conversations, they're getting the most value by working with, you know, a planner with a five mindset. Wow. So that's a great question. So there's really two sides of it. There's the quantitative side, tangible value that, you know, most people are looking for with an advisor. And there's the qualitative value, which is it's hard to understand the value until you've gone through it. So I'll actually start with the qualitative value, because I think that's the thing that sticks with people and makes you go, wow, I didn't realize, right, this is what financial planning could be. And the funny way I say it is the product that I provide as a financial planner is actually clarity and confidence, which are two things that you can't like, there's no quantitative metric for how you feel and how you think about money. For example, I work with a lot of you know married couples or just you know couples living together. And we can probably relate to this. There's usually a financial spouse who's kind of like 
they're the ones like doing the trades and they're the ones looking at the checking account, opening up uh, M1 Finance every day. And then there's a spouse who doesn't really look at it every day. And a lot of partners actually make the false assumption that the quote unquote non-financial spouse is not interested in the finance. But what they are interested in, you know, sadly, is the false assumption is they're very interested in the personal part of personal finance. So working with a financial planner in terms of qualitative, it may actually be the first opportunity that spouses or partners are talking about communicating about money in a healthy way and collaboratively defining their goals as a family. You know, sometimes there might, I know certainly in the uh, Facebook community, there's this question often of like, how do I get my spouse on board with FI? And having a third party, like more of like an objective opinion, having a moderator, a mediator between spouses and you know, helping collaboratively define those financial objectives and certainly on the qualitative side, that can be a, like a, a dynamic qualitative value. Yeah. And Cody, I'm curious, how do you facilitate that? So someone comes in to significant others, spouses, whatever you want to call it. They come in, they're sitting down in front of you. What do you do to open that line of communication that these people may never have spoken about money ever before? Like, are there initial questions? Like, how do you talk people through that just to get the ball rolling? So actually, the qualitative financial conversations, I base off of quantitative metrics. So what's really interesting is I collect all of the financial data, which is typically like 40 to 50 financial documents before we have that meeting to define scenarios for planning. But what's interesting is I believe that those quantitative financial documents actually tell a story about a family. My, my big joke is that if I have a pay statement, a social security statement, and a tax return for a family, sometimes I know more about their family, you know, especially the financial side, but sometimes I know more about them than they sometimes they realize about themselves. And a good example of this, so this is a possible scenario where I can learn a lot about, um, especially the non-financial spouse. So a family will send me their social security statement. Most of them think they're sending it to me because on page one, there's the what you'll receive at age 62, full retirement age, or age 70 for social security benefits. But first of all, you know we can talk about this later, but really those numbers are wrong. They really assume that what you made last year, you're going to make until you claim benefits, which in the, you know, the FI community isn't really you know, usually realistic. But what I do is I go to page two and I look at the earnings history, which says literally every year that you have earnings for social security reasons, and I can see there's two things on a social security statement that some families may not know that's there. It's one is I know their date of birth. And second, I know the first year they worked and how much they made that year. So let, let's say, for example, that Susie is the non-financial spouse, right? I can actually start the conversation by saying, hey, Susie, I noticed that you started working at age 15. You earned $2,000 that year. Like, that's incredible. Tell me about your first job. So what's really amazing is you can take this like black and white quantitative data that tells a story about a family and turn that into a very uh, an opportunity for active listening. And what's really amazing about that is when I asked Susie about her first job and exactly how much she earned and what year she started working, that question only applies to her. So that's a really great opportunity to start aligning how we think about money with how we think about our lives. And that's very different from going into a meeting and just saying, Susie, tell me about money growing up. Or some, you know, there's a question some people ask that's, you know, tell me about your first memory with money which is actually a pretty cool question to ask. But sometimes that creates pain points. Sometimes that creates like, I can't really think back that far, right? But if you ask somebody about their first job and you know when they tell you that their first job was working in an ice cream parlor, they got to keep half of the, you know, every ice cream sundae they, they sold, they got to keep half, right? That can develop, you know, we can go deeper and I can ask, hey, with your first job, was that an opportunity for you to be independent with money for the first time? So what's funny is asking those quantitative questions like you're based on the quantitative data, can really help them define even in themselves how they think about money, whether it's a scarcity mindset or the opposite, where like they were just like, oh no, it was my opportunity to like, you know, buy more stuff that I wanted that my parents wouldn't buy me. Whereas some spouses might say, you know, I worked that job so I could help my family pay the bills. So I think the qualitative stuff can actually come out of what we find as kind of the boring black and white data. I think one of the uh, things that comes through as I've seen a little bit of your work and as I've listened to other interviews that you've done is the personal aspect of the plan that you're putting together. And you people maybe have heard just a little aspect of that now. But I think, you know, going back to that earlier statement where we said that the CFP industry was largely born out of a sales mechanism for insurance back in the day, originally. What I feel like I always saw with insurance people that were kind of hanging outside the the pharmacy school waiting to grab us right before we got out of our fourth year of pharmacy school, Western Mutual, uh, <laughs> is 
you know, they had these very templatized future projections of what this whole life insurance with ridiculous premiums would do for me. And I feel like that is even with if I were to just kind of make a very generic template, that's what most people kind of associate with financial planning is just a bunch of graphs showing expected whatever 40 years from now, right. you know, and, and you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You, I got, you got me. I'll send you the Christmas card every year. The numbers look good. You're going to be okay. <laughs> How do you actually truly personalize a financial plan for someone that is, you know, not thinking in terms of 40 year timelines, but Hey, I'm going to be making moves now. I'm in my late thirties, early forties. I'm, I'm aggressively positioning ourselves for financial independence. How do you personalize that? Yeah, it's amazing. I think that as an advisor, I can't be just stuck to using the tools that exist for like the average traditional retiree. So my planning process, I've developed my entire process not using financial planning software. So my entire process is built in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and PDFs, which you know DIY investors can actually create their own plan from scratch using those basic tools. So what I've done, for example, is I've, I've built a my own retirement savings calculator that actually the outputs includes things like your Coast FI age, it actually lays out you know, every year that you could possibly retire. And you can see that year of, hey, I've reached Coast FI for age 55, meaning maybe I can go part-time or maybe one spouse can stop working. As long as we can maintain our living expenses through age 55, we're already on track to meet our traditional retirement needs. So I built my own tools, including education calculators. I have a pay statement calculator. So yeah, I think... To really personalize a process that works specifically, you know, with the FI community, you have to go beyond, you know, what other companies are building in terms of tools, because we are very much like thinking differently, both in like the quantitative and like the philosophy of financial independence. So I think that's a perfect springboard. We really wanted to talk about financial planning for the DIY investor. And we mentioned quickly that a lot of these qualitative questions are built on quantitative numbers. And so... If we were to come back to that, and as Brad says, close the loop, like, all right, what should we aggregate? You know, whether we're working to aggregate this information for a session with a financial planner, or really we're trying to just aggregate it for ourselves to come up with, you know, this holistic view of our financial ecosystem, maybe for that first conversation with our spouse, because we're trying to replicate this, you know, what is the data that we should review as part of this process? So I'd actually be happy to share what I call a data gathering checklist so this is a list of all of the financial documents that I, I think any family, whether you're working with a financial advisor, actually, especially if you're not working with one, right? So you can just have that awareness, that recurring awareness and understand that plan is a noun and a verb, right? This is an ongoing process. We call it on the path to FI, right? So as we're going on the path to FI, it's important to, to look at all this, what I call your, your full financial ecosystem. So a data gathering checklist includes, you know, I won't talk about everything on it because certainly we'll share the link, but that really includes things like understanding your real estate, right? So like when's the last time you look at your appraisal district website to see maybe the history of your appraisal for your house? Is that a thing? <laughs> you're like, I like going going is, is, should I be using a different number? <laughs> you're like, yeah, like you're my homestead in my house. Like what is the appraisal of both? You know, there's a land value and a home value, like a property value. So just understanding more about your property. Sometimes you might find information on there about, you know, what the county assumes the last time, you know, when your roof was put on, right? So you might want to correct some of the things as you review them. So, you know, real estate, another one is certainly all your investment statements, bank accounts, taxable brokerage, retirement, things like 529 or, you know, covered L for education. It's really important. We think of all these things as squirrely accounts in our lives. Like we just like, oh, we have money over there and money over there. But not until you pull it all together, can you understand, like really consolidate your financial ecosystem on the investment side. That's an opportunity to look at what I call your total portfolio. Rather than looking at things sporadically, you're like, okay, all of these different things in my life are playing different roles. And the analogy I use is imagine like a baseball field and every one of your accounts is a different player on the field. A lot of families, especially, you know, I certainly see this in the financial independence is that we kind of invest the same way in every account. So it's like every player on the baseball field is standing on first base, like with a baseball bat in their hand, right? So it's really important. First, you have to make record and note of all of these things, consolidate them. It's kind of like bringing in the baseball team to have a team meeting. And then you can go, you know, I, I always say that if you don't tell your money what to do, it tells you what to do. So in terms of investments, we're going to give every dollar a job and a use by date. So Cody, let me drill down on that. So let's just talk about, about me personally and, and how I go about tracking my net worth and looking at my statements. I do a quarterly net worth 
basically, you know, I obviously I have personal capital linked up, but I, I do my own Excel sheets quarterly. You know, the first day of, of the next quarter, I just go into every single account. I log in, I get a balance and I'm kind of happy just with the balance. But I guess my question to you is, is there additional information that I can glean from these statements? And should I actually be looking a layer deeper and tracking what exact investments I have inside of those, all of the various accounts that I have? Right. Yeah. It's really important. I think most of us think of these things as like, you have like a vehicle and passengers, right? So like your Roth IRA, your 401k, you know, your 403b, if you're lucky enough, like all these things are vehicles. And it's really important to understand that there's, especially in the tax world, there's really tax efficient passengers for each vehicle. So some of the things that you can look at when you're looking at your investment accounts beyond just like, you know, what, you know, what I'm investing in and what's the balance is things like what we call asset tax location. Once you figure out all your accounts together, each of those vehicles has a different tax characteristic, whether it's pre-tax, right? Your traditional 401k, traditional IRA, things like that. Then you have your taxable, which we know is just our kind of our taxable brokerage accounts. And then we have tax-free, which is our Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, things like HSAs that are growing tax-free, hopefully for tax-free distribution. So one thing that you could do, Brad, in your spreadsheet moving forward is maybe you can make a pie to show what is your asset tax location? What is your balance between those three tax characteristics? Because as we know, in the financial independence community, we kind of underappreciate the power of cash flow flexibility and income tax control until it's kind of too late. So if I work with families that want to be financially independent when they're 50, guess what? They can't use the rule of 55. They have the 10% penalty kind of waving around. But when they get to that point, they say, oh, wow, like literally all my money, you know, 99% of my money is in my traditional 401k. So I, I urge members of the financial independence community to start thinking about tax efficient, you know, the tax location of your assets from the very beginning. So that once you do, if you want to be financially independent at 50, you have a really great balance. So that cash flow flexibility comes from the taxable brokerage, right? Every dollar you take out, there's no tax consequence to actually taking money out of the account. But you know, but all of those assets, you know, the dividends, interest, the capital gains and losses are all taxable in the year they occur. So you want a lot of flexibility from, from a vehicle like that. Whereas you want your Roth IRA, most likely, you know, for example, the Roth conversion ladders, we think is like a great opportunity for early retirement. But one kind of misconception about that is when you take money out of a Roth IRA, you're no longer going to get tax-free growth for the rest of your life and maybe your future dependence on that money. So I think, Brad, on your spreadsheet, yeah, go ahead and put all of those different accounts into their respective tax location. So you can make sure that you, you don't necessarily have to have like a 33% all around, right? But you can say, hey, like how much flexibility, especially once you reach Coast FI for traditional retirement, you can say, okay, well, now that I've reached traditional retirement with my 401k, maybe I can focus on putting more money in my taxable brokerage account because I really value that flexibility and income tax control. I'm looking at this checklist that you put together and you shared actually inside the group, and we'll have a link to that as well in the show notes for this page. But, you know, the, the first kind of header category was investment statements. And we, we kind of overviewed, you know, a, a few of how those might come into play. And the biggest thing that came to your mind in terms of, you know, going one level deeper is what's the tax allocation? What's the treatment? And how that might affect, you know, a, a five plan. If you keep scrolling down, the next one is liability statements. And, you know, all of us can probably have, you know, mortgages, in some cases, car loans. Many people still have student loans, credit card debt, maybe additional private loans. Like when they're reviewing these, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of a conversations that should spill out of this? Absolutely. With liabilities, there's a lot of debate about should I pay off my debt or quote unquote invest the rest? And what's happening right now with low interest rates is everybody's coming, not everybody, right? But most, especially with the financial independence communities, we're coming at this as like a very rational approach. So for example, over every rolling 30-year period invested in the S&P 500, going back like all the way to like the 1920s, the annualized total return, the lowest it's been over a 30-year period is 8.5%. So there's this rational approach of saying, okay, well, the interest rate on my 30 year mortgage is 3.25. Like, no way I'm paying that off early, right? But the one thing that's important in terms of you know, doing your own financial planning is yes, it's, it's important to understand the rational approach. So you got that covered, right? But now it's important to understand the, the reasonable approach, which is going back to thinking about my money in terms of time. So if you're going to look at your liability statement, why not look at 
maybe maybe determine you know, maybe you can build your own calculator or you know certainly there's a lot online go ahead and calculate hey what age will i be when my mortgage is fully paid off if paid minimally it may not be a bad thing for you to have a mortgage till you're 70 but just have the like the awareness that that's going to be the case if you pay it off minimally also understand you know there are quantitative sides to that too is saying hey if i pay off my mortgage minimally i'm going to pay you know $200,000 in interest over that time and it's just that clarity to say like you know just understanding both sides of the opportunity cost you might even continue to pay minimally on your mortgage but you'll know exactly why you're doing it rather than just saying like oh i read an article that told me to or like somebody in the facebook group said that was the best way to do it if you look at the rational and reasonable approach to every financial decision, you have so much clarity and confidence moving forward that you made the right decision. This is uh, just a timely little anecdote, and I don't want to rob any more of the stuff that we're going to review, but going to that exact point, interest rates are insanely low, low right now. I mean, we're at like a 30-year floor probably on these things. Maybe they've never been lower than they are on average right now. And we had already gotten a, uh, the last time that we thought that they were kind of low is, you know, 3.5 on a 30-year, something along those lines. And uh, we locked one in for our mortgage. And now I found out I could get a 2.75, <laughs> something like that. It's something absurd on a 30 year, 2.75. And um, I had a five point, trying to remember. It had, had about $5,000 in what it would cost me to refinance this mm, to thing. To do it all over again, right? Yeah. To, to do it all. So I'll add 5,000 to my balance and I'll reduce my monthly payment by some 160 odd dollars a month, right. something, something like that. And my recoup time. And I'm just saying all this to say, I actually ended up deciding not to refi because I think I'm just going to start paying my mortgage down a little bit more aggressively. I don't think I'm going to have this for, you know, I mean, I'm sure I'll have a mortgage for five more years, but I don't think it's going to be worth the friction to actually go through that. But that's a decision I made just in my own head. Didn't really communicate it, you know, too, too much. If obviously if we had actually gone down the path, it would need to have been agreed on, but um, you know, going through some sort of liability statement like this and using this as a springboard to have these conversations. What are our goals with regards to our mortgage? What are our goals with regards to, are we going to take out debt in the future? Or are we going to move towards increasingly debt-free? And we're going to prioritize paying down all of these things. Like all of these should be springboards for these conversations or opportunities for these conversations with your partner. Absolutely. I think that also, you know, there's, the, there's also a debate about, you know, renting versus buying, right? We don't have to go too much into that, but I think it's important to people to understand that your house payment, they actually call in the, uh, the mortgage lending business is PITI, which is uh, your, your principal, your interest, your property taxes, and your homeowner's insurance, PITI, is understanding, you know, you might want to create your own rule of thumb for how much leverage you want to take there, right? So the rule of thumb that mortgage lenders take, which again, they always want you to kind of take a bigger house than you might be able to afford. They use a 28% of gross income or less is like a healthy benchmark for PITI. So maybe as a family, you can create your own benchmark for leverage saying, hey, we don't want our PITI to exceed 20% of our gross income. So just because there's rules of thumb out there doesn't mean you can't create like your own for your family. Say, hey, like we're going to create our own philosophy and kind of our, our own framework for how we're going to leverage our property. Cody, it's interesting how, uh, you know, I think about personal finance a fair amount, obviously, uh, as you would assume, being the host of Choose a Five. But just that thought that you brought up about, okay, how old are you going to be when you still have a mortgage? I never thought about that. We just refinanced recently. And that means I literally will be in my 70s, my early 70s, <laughs> when I still have that mortgage, if I don't pay a dollar extra. Even just that was a sobering thought of, wow, do I really want to be 71 years old and still have a mortgage? So it's interesting how even for somebody like me, who again, thinks about this fairly often, like that was a thought provoking question. So I mean, that was very cool in and of itself. I guess I'm going to ask a very similar question about the liability statements that I asked about the investment, which is when people are thinking about their financial plan for the first time. And again, it's pretty obvious you would put the balances down. But what else do you suggest? Would people put the interest rate, the term? Like, what are people looking for outside of just the very obvious, hey, this is what I owe on my credit cards or this is what I owe on my house? Right. Certainly, uh, interest rate. Another thing that's very important is PMI, which is called primary mortgage insurance. So, if you buy a house right now, you know, typically with less than 20% down, you're going to be paying primary mortgage insurance. So, you're actually paying for insurance that if you're financially stable, you probably don't really need that insurance, but they force you to have that insurance until you've paid 20% down. 
So one thing that I do, so this is a connection between the appraisal, you know, you're going to go in and you're going you're gonna to look at your appraisal district website to see what the appraisal on your house is. Not just going through Zillow, but like through what your county thinks it's worth. You need to calculate the equity that you have in your house. If your equity is greater than 20% and you're paying PMI, guess what? You need to knock on the door, you know, give a phone call to your lender and say, hey, I would like to request what's called an external appraisal. So for example, my last house, like I was just at that line where I thought my house was, if my house was just worth like 20,000 more, I could remove PMI. I removed about three years of $90 a month of PMI by doing a $100 external appraisal on my house, wow. right? So that's one thing, like you connecting the appraisal district information with how much you owe on the mortgage. Another thing too, is that a lot of people, they, they escrow, right? They have this escrow account where you pay in your, um, your homeowner's insurance and your property taxes directly as a part of your mortgage payment. And you know, I know we're, we're trying to be super efficient with like getting extra money even on our cash. So why not, especially if you're at a, a healthy place, you know, maybe you, you want to self-escrow. You might, maybe you want to save for those things yourself, whether it's like high yield checking or ho however you, it's not really about making money on the cash, right? Because that money needs to have an objective, uh, an investment objective of stability and liquidity. But I think it's really an opportunity to take back some control of your finances and say, you know what, like I, I'm going to be responsible and I want to go ahead and save for those things on my own rather than you know, adding that to an escrow account. So it's not that escrow is bad or anything, but I think just the awareness about where your money's going in all of these financial areas is so important. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose FI team. Hope you're enjoying the interview. We're going to get right back to it right after these quick messages. Cody, I'm again, I'm referring to this checklist. I really hope that everybody listening to this does take the time to use this as a springboard for this data collection and also hopefully the conversations that come out of it. The next category on here, income and expenses. And we talked about how much can be gleaned. I find that the most useful pay stub for me personally is that last pay stub of the year, if I have it. You know, just kind of like that year in review pay stub, just so much data on it. When you combine that with the social security statements, that seems like that you've, you've pointed out how that might actually be used. But also, you know, you pair with that, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to take a look at what did our life actually cost. If you're tracking all of these kind of different categories of expenses, what a great opportunity to have that. I have a question for you, though, on this one. If someone has not been, quote unquote, budgeting, you know, drop that word in here. Do you have any quick tips for what you would want to know in terms of annual living expenses that spread out, some coming out of checking, some coming out of credit card? What is it that you really want to know here under this category? So in terms of expenses, I think this is what's funny. So people think about budgeting as like a four letter word. It's like nobody likes the word budget, but I've actually redefined how I think about budgeting. I call it budgeting 2.0. But the way I define budgeting is, again, going back to that aligning your money with your values. So I say budgeting is about reducing expenses on the things that don't provide value so you can spend and save extravagantly on the things that do. So I'm just going to share a little exercise that I do so I actually don't specifically ask, you know, families I serve, I don't say like, hey, tell me how much you spend on coffee. Tell me how much you spend on like pet massages and whatever is in your budget. But I go through this exercise. It's, I think it's very valuable, again, especially with couples. So step one is that you export your spending, whether that's YNAB or just, you know, your credit card or banking website, you export that into Excel. So step one is just export your, your spending, period. Right. Number two is you're going to sort all of those categories, right? Credit card statements usually categorize for you. So you don't have to spend too much time doing that. So number two is you sort those categories by largest to smallest dollar amount. So that really shows like where your money's going. Of course, in you know, Excel, you can quickly just say like, what's the percentage going toward this thing, right? That's important. I mean, it's really interesting when I find when families say like they actually spend less than 1% of their money on like continued education or therapy and things that like really can move the needle in terms of like providing more value to your life. Sometimes like the smallest part of the budget could really you know, help in the long run. So you sort your categories largest to smallest by dollar amount. So three is that you copy and paste that and put another column right you know, to the right of that. But this time you put all those categories in order by how much subjective value they provide to your life. What's really interesting here is that once you have those two side by side, you can draw lines to where like groceries are on the dollar amount to where groceries are in terms of how much value they provide to you. And the greatest misalignment in where you, what you're paying for and what you value, that's really the place to start budgeting, like to reducing expenses. So a good example here is, let's say that cooking at home provides a lot more value to you and your family than eating out, but eating out is actually like above groceries 
on your spreadsheet, that shows you an opportunity to start cutting expenses on eating out. So you can actually, not that you just stop spending money on food, but that you can shift that money again, putting that into you know spending ex- actually more extravagantly on groceries because that's really what you really value. So when you're collecting living expenses, don't think of it as just like a judgmental, shameful, like this is, oh, I can't believe my money went here. But just like, develop a practice for like, especially collaboratively with your spouse, if you're married is like, figure out if you're, what you're spending your money on truly aligns with your values. And of course, using a spreadsheet, how cool, right? <laughs> like do all that. <laughs> oh, Cody, <laughs> only in the FI community would we call that cool, right? But I, but I, I do like that. So Right. It's not just listing your expenses for the sheer hell of it. It's trying to get an understanding. Like I'm picturing like a like a pie graph in my head of like, okay, where does my money go? Right. And I don't think I've ever done that exercise. And I, I like how you also focus on this is not just about, hey, where can we cut? Because you might find in your own subjective standpoint, you place a lot of value on health and fitness, but yet that's the 27th category that you spend money on. And you might say, wow, there's something misaligned here. If my fourth highest category is eating out and health and fitness <laughs> is 27. So like that is something that might wash out of an exercise like that, that might be completely out of your brain. Like you might not have any comprehension of it. So yeah, that's really, really cool, Cody. I like that. Well, and I say too, and this comes back to the, there's a lot of debate about the latte factor kind of stuff. Like, you know, if you, there, there's a big joke also, it says like, if you were to just stop spending money on that $5 coffee for the next 20 years, you know, in 20 years, you'd have uh, like a really miserable life. <laughs> you, you, people always focus on how much money you'd have. But I, I always say like, well, what if that $5 cup of coffee is your favorite part of the day? So this is in that exercise, that cup of coffee, that eating out would be like a large expense, but it would be very large on your like subjective value measure too. So you wouldn't start cutting spending on those things that really make you smile every day. You know, I, I'm sure as we kind of progress through these and we start thinking about things like insurance, the obvious ones comes to mind, like what type of life insurance are do you have here? And you know, how do your premiums affect your budget? And what is the return on that in terms of like, not return, return, but it, like, what's the goal here? What, what objective is this serving? But you move past life insurance and there's health insurance. Is that covered through your employer? Maybe what are your what are your plans on the other side of employment? And other ones come to mind that, you know, homeowners insurance obvi- is in another obvious homeowners and auto insurance are one that we have. But the three that, you know, kind of end up with a conversation and it's going to be very subjective is going to be disability insurance, long term care insurance and umbrella insurance. And we don't need to get too into the weeds in this conversation other than to say some people really are trying to figure out how that fits into their five plan. And those likely would end up being a part of, you know, a conversation that is going to, it's going to necessitate some qualitative conversations. I wanted to get your input on this next category, the employee benefits packages, because I think this is one that is not highlighted nearly enough. And most people know immediately about the 401k, but everything else is just kind of the black hole. (laughs) Yeah. So it's funny. A lot of people are actually going through open enrollment right now, right? If they've gotten that big well, now it's like a big PDF rather than a big booklet, which probably just goes into like the kind of the spam mail. <laughs> but employee benefits are really interesting. M- most employees don't understand truly how well they're compensated. They especially don't see what the employer pays for, but they also don't see the, the like kind of the, the voluntary benefits. Uh, one big thing that I see missed a lot is that I work with a young family. You know, they just young family. You know, they have three kids, and I say, you know, do you have your estate documents in place? Right, your wills your powers of attorney, advanced directives, even your beneficiary designations. Like when's the last time you made sure that your, all your assets would pass outside of probate to the people you actually want to pass them to. But when we go through the employee benefits handbook, actually aligned with the pay statement, there's an opportunity if you don't have your estate documents drafted yet, many employers actually offer a voluntary, what's called a group legal plan. And typically for like around $200 a year, you can have access to a full team of attorneys to set up your wills, your trust, to even do stuff like real estate transactions, maybe set up a new LLC for your side hustle business. So for literally $200 a year through a group benefit, you can do what usually costs through you working with an attorney privately, like, you know, thousands of dollars, right? So there's there's a lot of opportunities for employee benefits. I've also seen some employers even pay 100% for adoption. So I think there's a lot of expenses that we're assuming our employers not really interested in helping us cover that. Um, and some, some employers are even doing student loan repayment. Like they're helping you pay back your student loans, kind of like a 401k for student loan repayment. 
Cody, I know I personally made use of that in my company. It was called prepaid legal. And yeah, it was, it was similar. It was like 15 or $18 a month. It was something absurdly inexpensive. So basically for around $200 plus or minus, I was able to sign up for it at open enrollment. You know, that next year I got a will and, and trust and whatever set up. And then I just canceled it the next mm-hmm. year. Right. So I basically got $1,500 worth of legal bills for that $200 that I paid for. So yeah, that was a, a really cool benefit that I just had no idea it existed, except I had a conversation with a coworker. And that's another thing you can do with your vision plan, right? So some people are like, I'm only going to get mm. glasses like every two years, right? Like, and again, I would think of dental and vision as less about insurance and more of a discount plan. I would say health insurance certainly is like real, like I, you know, you need that, that's real insurance. But I think a lot, especially in the five community, we can kind of self-fund probably, um, you know, dental and vision. But if you're going to do something like vision, yeah, maybe think like, hey, I'm just going to get my like tons of boxes of contacts every two years, right? And just like kind of like flip that switch of on and off when you're not using it. Yeah, that's cool. I, I'd love to hear you talk more in depth about the beneficiary designations. I think that's something that should be top of mind for a lot of people. And I'm not sure how often you should readdress that, how people would go about even finding out if they have beneficiaries designated, et cetera. So yeah, love to hear you talk through that. Yeah. So what's really interesting is that you have all these different accounts in your life, either your taxable brokerage, your retirement accounts. A lot of people don't realize that. So the will, you know, when you have a will, a lot of people think of this as like, oh, when I die, this is who gets my stuff. The will is actually secondary to account titling and beneficiary designations. So what this means is on every one of your retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, otherwise, and insurance policies as well, you can list both primary and contingent beneficiaries. So that means that if I had my my wife Marissa as you know listed, you know, primary beneficiary for my 401k, if something were to happen to me, it would actually pass directly to her. So all she would have to do is provide her ID and a death benefit to let's say, you know, M1 Finance or Fidelity, and they would create a, like a spousal, you know, IRA for her. So that passed actually outside of probate court, like outside of, you know, the state and the county. Like I didn't have to go through this like month long process for her to have access to that asset because it passed outside. So beneficiary designations is a way for yeah those retirement accounts, your life insurance policies all have this as well. And also your taxable brokerage accounts, you can add account titling designations. There's POD, payable on death, which is typically your bank accounts. There's transfer on death with taxable brokerage accounts. And there's joint tenants with right of survivorship, which you'll typically see as JTWROS which is another way that, for example, your taxable brokerage account, your checking account with your spouse can pass directly outside of probate. And the biggest issue here is that let's say that you you own an account just individually. Let's say your emergency fund is just under your name. If something were to happen to you, your spouse would have to go through the probate process to even get access to that account. So that it might be six months before they can get to that emergency fund that you really needed like immediately upon death. When you're building your balance sheet, most of us focus on the net worth number. But I would say on a balance sheet, the two things to focus on are account titling, beneficiary designations. And then the second part is, again, that asset tax location of how much control and flexibility do you have of all your different accounts. Cody, one point of clarification. So are you saying that these designations, they supersede what would be in your will? So let's say hypothetically, if I get hit by a bus in my will, everything would go to my wife, Laura. But let's say I had an old IRA that you know I opened when I was 20 years old, and my brother was put on as the beneficiary. Would that pass to him since he was specifically designated as the beneficiary? Or would like which would supersede which, I guess? Yeah, that's correct. So the IRA would pass directly to him. Hmm. And yeah, and the thing is, regardless, so even in the will, you could say the IRA goes to my spouse. But like that will, another thing too, is that the will actually has to go through a public probate process. So and this is really interesting in terms of privacy, your IRA in that circumstance, like maybe passed to your brother, right outside of probate. And nobody in the world knows that happened. That's a private transaction that titling to his name. But if you had an account that was titled individually, that would have to go through the probate process. Your will is public record. So I can literally look up anybody who's passed away with a will and read it. Like you can read Aretha Franklin, you know, like people like that. You can, you know, if they have a will set up, you can really see the the privacy of that. It's very interesting. So yeah, you would want to really make sure that your beneficiary designations, uh, again, yeah, they, they supersede the will, which goes through probate. A lot of people say, I have a will, I don't have to go through probate, but the will specifically goes through the probate process. 
one thing that comes to my mind as we were talking about beneficiary designations, and we were also mentioning wills, is the one aspect of you had another kid, you had another child. So you created this will or this document, you were taking the right steps with your first child maybe, or, or before you had a child. Anyways, the number of members in the family has changed, points of consideration, things that people may need to do there if they need to manually update their will. Is that a simple task? Do you need to get a lawyer involved again, or is that just quite literally you noting something in your will? Yeah, so that's called a codicil. It's just an amendment that you can make. I would say that's the most important part of a will is actually when you have minor children is it's called guardianship provision. So that's like who takes care of the kids if something happens to both of us. So some wills, you can specifically just say like my children, you can just say like children in general. Usually the will will say like, you know, I have two kids, blah, blah, blah. But it might just say like my children, the guardian provision for, you know, take care of my child will be my sister, so-and-so. But you can also, if you have, you know, give birth to another child, you can simply add a codicil, which is just an, a quick amendment. And again, a will only really needs a notary. Like you don't need an attorney to be present when you sign a will. It's really just a notary and witnesses. There's also things called like holographic wills, but I, you know, I'd, I'd stay out of that. I'd really make this like really a very clear document that's not handwritten. <laughs> but yeah, it's a simple change, but a simple change can make a huge difference, especially, you know, we, we, we think, you know, the last thing I want is for the state to determine, you know, the county to determine like, you know, where my kids go. So I would say the most important state document is actually the powers of attorney for financial and for, for medical. And then the wills specifically for that guardian provision, because so again, so many things can pass outside of the will with just really intentional account titling and beneficiary designations. So I think what we're trying to communicate is it's not just your net worth. It's not just what is your fine number and does your net worth, you know, is it approaching that number and then you're done? You got to look at this holistically. Here are the components that go into a comprehensive financial plan. You know, in terms of categories, your investment statements, your liability statements, your income and expenses, your insurance statements, your employee benefits packages, your income tax returns, your estate documents. These are core features of a holistic financial plan. And then those give you quantitative numbers. Now you got to add the qualitative on top of that. What is it that you want? And are these getting you there? You know, and are there optimizations you can make to further streamline that process? So the, the next part of that that I want to just circle back to and, and through the lens of working with an advisor is just that financial planner is a very broad term that covers <laughs> a huge array of services, some of which are much more optimized than others. And many people in the financial independence community, once they've seen the race to zero with fees with their funds, resent the fact that on their two to $3 million portfolio, they're paying 20 to $30,000 a year to have their money be in an index fund where it's just trying to keep up with the market. And they say, well, this is the least optimized aspect of what it is that I'm doing. I don't, I'm not looking for someone to outperform the market. I'm just trying to keep up with the market. Why do I need to pay someone that much just to keep up with the market in a simple index fund? Okay, that makes sense. So your different models that you have out there are AUM, assets under management. Then you have fee-only advisor, which can mean a bunch of different things, I guess. There's, there's some confusion there. And then there's the space that you've really uh, found yourself that's really worked well for you, which is, I believe, advice only. And so maybe Correct. could you just reiterate how yours differentiates specifically from fee only? Because I think that's probably the biggest mm. divide. A lot of people understand the assets under management and say, I'm not really too excited about that. But I don't think there's maybe quite as much clarity as there could be around this fee only versus advice only. Right. So yeah, advice only is fee only financial planning without the expectation, obligation, or even the option to have your investments managed. And what this means is there's this thing called the form ADV. So it's a regulatory brochure that we have as advisors that say, what's the service we provide? How do we charge for that service? Um, an advice only financial planner doesn't even have the option. You know, they've, they've set it up on purpose so that like in terms of regulation, they cannot have any discretion over investments. So the only service they provide is personalized financial education to really help families make, you know, make and implement their own well-informed decisions. And there's three compensation models within advice only. And it's really, you can do kind of what people know as like the one-time plan. You know, I just want like, I want somebody to just kind of look over at one time and kind of say, if, am I on track? What am I missing here? I don't know what I don't know. That's called project-based planning. The second one is hourly, right? So I know you've had uh, Sean Mulaney on, on the podcast before, the Fi tax guy, right? So he does hourly advice only planning, which is really, you know, you, you collaboratively create a scope of engagement and say, hey, I think this is going to take this many hours. You know, this is how much planning I need. And then the third, so there's project-based 
hourly, and then there's retainer, like subscription. So sometimes I always say do-it-yourself investors are not all learn-it-yourself investors. So they might, you know, they don't want the advisor to be the, the hero of the story, but they really want a guide for like ongoing accountability. So if you want to work with an advisor, a financial planner, who's not going to manage your money, but you want to be able to kind of check in with them maybe quarterly or monthly, there's a retainer subscription model that a lot of financial planners use. Right. And I know when a lot of people hear the word only, especially in the general public, I just want people to really latch onto this. When you hear the word only, like fee only <laughs> or advice only, they're like, well, you mean I want the whole package? I mean, I want everything. I mean, I want the ultimate package. That's what I want. And and I think only maybe in this community and only maybe with me reiterating it, can you appreciate that? No, what you actually wanted was the information, the advice, the coaching, the someone to help you get the results. You did not want everything else, which was the bloat that was dragging your portfolio returns down with that, you know, assets under management model. Yeah. Or even the option to sell you an insurance product, an annuity. What's right. amazing is I can, I can tell a young family, this is how much you need in term life insurance and they'll get it because I, I don't, there's no reason for me to suggest something that it's not going to, I'm not going to get paid like for doing. So it's, it's amazing to have like really the truly objective, you know, it's as close to conflict free as I think you can get from working with a planner. Yes, that's completely it. And so while obviously there's conflicts of interest with pretty much everything, right? I mean, it's some sort of trade of, of value, your money for some sort of service rendered, but it gets worse as you go down the spectrum. The assets under management model is the person that thinks, wow, my financial planner is free. I don't pay him a dime. <laughs> no, they cost you half of your portfolio's returns over a 30 or 40 year period. I mean, it's they probably cost you millions of dollars in this particular case. Hopefully you are at least able to keep up with, you know, it's that sort of thing. All right. And then we move our way down and then it's a fee only advisor. And then, sorry, sorry, then the, we're actually AUM is still within fee only. That's what's tricky. Right. Okay. So, so, so it's <laughs> AUM inside of fee only. <laughs> And Danny Kenny came on our show and he was talking about this. Mm -hmm. You had, you have to ask people, are you a fiduciary in every aspect of your business? So on this aspect, I'm, I'm a fee only advisor, but I also sell insurance products over here. Like, how does that blend? If their profit center is insurance product, you might end up finding that whole life insurance is actually the solution to a lot of life's problems on a frequent enough basis to not be a coincidence, you know, <laughs> and then as you keep moving on down the line. You're, you're like, how can I reduce or minimize? And I think there are a lot of uh, fee-only advisors, if it's formulated the right way, that are absolutely perfect. And then you, you know, you've taken this approach where it's just truly advice only. I can't do any of that. I can't. Uh, the way I've structured my business, it, it it prevents me from doing any of that. Legally not allowed. That's yeah. It's it's actually that that deep. Yeah. That's fantastic, Cody. Do you find that there's any hesitation for people actually paying you? for a plan or advice. And, and I guess this to me actually gets to one of these kind of quirks in our operating system as humans, right? Like Jonathan latched onto this and, and I, I wrote this down before, quote, I don't pay my advisor, you said before. A lot of people think that because they're not literally cutting a check to the advisor for that 1%, which seems innocuous, right? Oh, it's just 1% and it gets taken out. They're not writing that check or they're not sending the money. But as we've discussed ad nauseum on the show, that 1% can make a difference of 30% of your net worth 30 to 50 years from now, as Jonathan also just mentioned, right? So that is an enormous cost. But since you're not actually cutting the check, it doesn't seem like you're paying your advisor. Whereas someone like you, who is as unbiased as you could be in that scenario, they have to actually cut you a payment. Like, do you find pushback from that? Do you have to convince people that it's worth it? Do you even bother with that? Like, is it, you know, talk me through that aspect of this business. Yeah, the, the analogy I use is, for example, most of us pay our income taxes through withholding. Imagine if withholding didn't exist and everybody had to send their in income taxes in, if they had to write that check physically every year to pay income taxes, right? Like, so it's very much that same feeling of like, wow, like I, and I, again, this comes back to the clarity, right? I mean, people are paying for things. They just don't. And Jonathan, you mentioned earlier that the internal expense ratios, right? Like not only are you paying maybe 1%, but they've got you in 1% funds sometimes, right? So like just the compounding. So yeah, I, I think first of all, it's the clarity of understanding what you're paying. But I, I do believe that, especially like our community, we really value transparency. Like when, you know, when somebody even comes over to our house to like fix the sink, we're like, just tell me what it's going to cost. Like you know, if you tell me how much it's going to cost, like maybe per hour or like 
<laughs> it's kind of gross, right? But you have somebody come over to like fix your toilet. Like they're not going to charge you based on like how clogged the toilet is, right? It's just like, <laughs> just fix the toilet. And I want to know exactly, you know, you, you get that quote up front. You know, the families I serve don't really question the fee because they understand that the value is a multiple of the cost. And I think that certainly is tricky for advisors. The reason it's kind of worked out for me is what I really, I kind of did on accident is I believe that the best way to learn is to teach. So I believe in really this philosophy of giving is a way of life, not a strategy. I love giving away financial education for free without expecting anything in return. And over time, again, it's like, how can you find a way to provide a lot of value before people even know that you're an advisor? So the reason just me specifically that you know families haven't questioned the fee is because they've already understand the value of planning before they knock on the door. And also, I never DM people, you know, when people ask for an advisor, I never say, hey, you can work with me. Like I, I'm always like my goal next year is to refer a thousand people to other planners, like without getting any, you know, without getting paid for it, without expecting anything in return. If you come from a place of value of just trying to wanting to help people, that just comes across over time. And the fee is just like, people are almost saying like, here, just, just charge me something because yeah, again, the value exceeds the cost. But the average advisor, I would say, you should just have these discussions, right? Of saying, hey, if this is going to cost $5,000 to do a financial plan, like what, what should I expect both in tangible quantitative value, but also qualitative? And you should really have those discussions, not just focusing on the, the dollar amount, the fee, right? In terms of tangible value, like financial planning, from what I've seen, I've got no, no guarantee. The average family I work with just doing like an intentional Roth conversion strategy saves them between 50 and 70% of their total taxes paid in their lifetime. Right, like that's huge tangible value, but I think that yeah, you, you have to show value in other ways before they even become your client. Well, I think that actually really is is a great summary and a place to land for people as they start to figure out how to go about approaching this themselves and how to make that decision about whether or not to work with an advisor. And one thing I know is you started your practice, you know, relatively recently. It hasn't, you know, you you really were emerging and going down this path of financial independence back in 2018, but it's only within the last year or two that you've been working on this practice and it's absolutely blown up. And I think in large part due to uh, how well regarded you are in the financial independence community. But I know you're also at capacity, right? I know that uh, you did not, you kind of have a five plan for your own life and that limited your hours and you build up your books very, very quickly with this. And you just stated this goal of, you know, if people are looking for a planner and this was one of the big things that I remember when I was, I was listening to you on the, on the Michael Kitts, this episode, I referenced this one other time. We'll have a link in the show notes as well. But there was one thing that you said in there is that people found you after interviewing 10 financial advisors and the common complaint was they couldn't find anyone that would be willing to give them just advice, give them a plan without <laughs> also the promise of being able to manage their money. And so I really wanted to point out to people this goal of yours to help people find someone that can work with them. Your way of giving back is a really big deal because it is hard to sift through all the noise that's out there. And so I'll give you two requests here. If people are interested in following up, going a little further and building their own DIY investing plan, where should they go? And then also, if they want to take you up on this offer of finding someone to work with that gets them and gets the goals of someone working in the financial independence community, what can they do about that as well to follow up? So if families want to start really going beyond the basics, right? You kind of know the fundamentals, but you want to start you know, aligning your money with your personal objectives. I'm specifically, you know, we talked about that data gathering checklist. I'm all about giving everything away. So in 2022, I'm documenting my entire financial planning process from the ground up, including how I created all the templates, all the calculators, and I'm sharing that, right? So I'm going to have a lot, you know, most of it's going to be free YouTube, Instagram kind of content for people to develop their own plan, but I'm also going to be creating video courses. That's at measuretwicemoney.com. Right now it's a blog, but it's going to turn into like a lot of, um, I'm limiting my capacity for one-on-one -on -one planning, as you mentioned, to working 10 hours a week on one-on-one -on -one planning so that I can spend the rest of my time creating that educational content for DIY investors, the FI community, and also teaching other financial planners about this philosophy and process. So that kind of like answers the second question, which is what I want to do ultimately with what I'm calling Measure Twice Planners is I'm going to show the philosophy and process, both of financial independence and how I go through my truly comprehensive planning process. And that will create really a pipeline for future referrals into the advice only space. So there's a like really a handful of advice only planners. I'm sure there's more that I don't know yet, but I hope that they reach out after this and let me know that they're truly advice only without asset management. I'm actually a part of a mastermind group 
of five planners and another mastermind group of advice only planners and the ones that really truly align with both. So, you know, Danny Kenny, who's been on the podcast before, Sean Mullaney, the Phytax guy, he has his own practice. Mike Powers, who's incredible. He just launched his own firm as a flat fee with investment management, if you'd like. Jorge Soriano. Again, all these people are really part of the, the FI community. And then uh, Jonathan Granick, who I just met, I met him at XY Planning Network. And there's a lot of advisors starting to rethink, first of all, who do I serve? Second, how do I provide value? And then only then, what's the most appropriate way for the families I serve to pay for that service? So those are really the, I think the advisors are already in this space. But my hope is that maybe there's, maybe there's 50 advisors who truly care about the philosophy of FI and can offer, not just offer, but again, the word only, <laughs> have advice only planning moving forward. I just want to add, you know, just this, this a general endorsement here in that it is very encouraging to find financial planners coming out of the financial independence community who've been able to build a business model that is re financially rewarding for them, but also really in the best interest of the people that have goals in this community. I mean, that really has been, you know, you, you talk about financial planning, but you always know, man, there's so many sharks out there. There's so many sharks out there. And what would it look like for the knowledge, which is so critical and the advice, which is so critical to truly be aligned with the overarching goals of this community. And just to see you, you know, really talking about that and being able to highlight these individuals and to see more people realizing, we don't need that crap. It may have felt like a necessary evil before, but you can actually have a successful practice. You can have a wonderful practice that is completely fine minded and have total alignment with my customers' goals. And I felt like that was historically, especially going back even like five years, that was like, you can be successful or you can- Or you can do the right thing and starve. <laughs> yeah, and starve. Right, yeah. Just, maybe you got to find the compromise between the two. And I don't think that's the case. And I just love that you guys are really advocating for this. And I hope we see many, many more planners join this. And I hope, I hope it becomes easier for anybody that feels like, you know what? I need someone to look over and personalize my plan. I, I love the, the concepts and the theories, but when it comes to implementation of some of these ideas, unless I have someone working with me to help me implement it, it's just simply not going to happen. And okay, let's remove that friction. What would it look like to remove that? Brad, final thoughts? Yeah, so Cody, measuretwicemoney.com. That's where you have all your free resources. Like you said, you're not looking for clients, so nobody has to worry about any uh, ulterior motives. And also... I assume we're going to list all of those planners that you just mentioned in the show notes. So I know you'll provide us their info and uh, people can sign up for your email list where I suspect very strongly you're going to be aggregating other planners who you would you know, certainly advise people can feel good about using. I think that's what's so cool is that this group of planners are starting from within the FI community. And you're trying to find other like-minded individuals. So yeah, it's really a very, very laudable goal. So thanks for putting it together. I appreciate it. And one quick thing is that um, from the beginning, I've, I'm being very intentional. So measure twice money, right? It, it, again, it's very difficult to get financial information without like a, and by the way, buy this or you know, I'm going to sell you something. So measure twice money is in no way like tied to my financial planning firm. So like, you know, measure twice money is truly educational, no advice, just really helping you ask better questions of your financial ecosystem and how your family is really thinking about money. They're truly educational. No, yeah, it's, it's not going to send you to my website to, to, you know, to work with me. And thankfully, you know, at capacity, it's even easier, right? My goal is to get to a place where, you know, revenue is taken care of. I got the 70% savings rate. Like I'm going, I want to be five by 40. That's kind of my goal. But now that that's taken care of, I can use Measure Twice Money as truly a resource to give it all away and hopefully empower the future of financial planners in our space. All right, Cody Garrett, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. All right, my friends, well, let's start working on our own financial planning documents. Let's start the process of aggregation. Let's use that as a springboard to have these conversations with our partners where applicable and let's take action. The fire spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.